thoughts and things. Welcome Facebook. It looks like we are now streaming. We're so excited to have everyone joining us tonight. We're going to get started in just about a minute. I definitely agree, Don. We should have had Jerome. Go ahead and get started. If we want to, awesome. Thank you so much. I hate to stop the music too. That was that was a jam, but we'll bring it back at the end. Um, thank you for that, Eli. Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here for tonight's Lean Into Allyship event, setting the pace leaders at the forefront of excellence. We are so thrilled and honored to be hosting tonight's special event um, with our guests. Kirby Mack, Kendra Whipple, and Anthony Cooper, three Madis, I'm sorry, and Aaron Hicks, I'm so sorry. Um, for, I'm so sorry, Aaron, I apologize. <laughs> Kirby Mack, Kendra Whipple, and Aaron Hicks, three Madison leaders as they share their authentic stories, including their influences, obstacles, what keeps them boldly setting the pace, and a conversation about celebrating Black joy. I am Samantha Jefferson, and along with my racial justice co-conspirators, Dan Beltran and AJ Keeler, and the entire Justified Anger team, we are so glad that you're here. So we want to reserve as much time as possible for Dr. Chi and our guests, but we are going to dive in as quick as possible and just cover a few of our standard housekeeping items real briefly. So first and foremost, as you have heard us advocate for in the past, um, if this is not your first LIA event, we ask that you strongly consider donating to Nehemiah tonight. We do not and cannot expect them to support um, these events and join us in this work and educate us for free. So um, please do consider doing that. We um, will be sharing resources and opportunities to do so and to get involved throughout the night in the chat. So um, keep an eye out for those, please. Um, just a heads up that we keep the chat function turned off during our sessions. Um, so that we are able to share those valuable resources um, in that space. But please do use the Q&A tonight at the bottom of your screen, um, because we will definitely have some opportunities to interact later in the event. If you are new to Lean Into Allyship, do not worry about capturing everything that is unpacked tonight. We know there's oftentimes, um, always, a lot of information, actually. So um, we always send out a follow-up email after each event, just recapping all of the resources shared, a link to this session, and previous sessions on Justified Anger's YouTube page um, and additional learning and volunteer opportunities that we will talk about this evening. So we really just ask that you be present for this really special, impactful next 75 minutes. And especially tonight, we encourage you to just minimize your distractions as much, much as possible um, and dive in with us. This hour is for all of us. And our intention behind Lean Into Allyship is always to empower would-be allies and allies in training um, by creating action-driven and honest spaces to grow together. And we really, again, just encourage you to be active participants in the conversation. You really um, get to play a large part in driving the second portion of our discussion. So like I said, be sure to enter your questions in the Q&A as they come out um, throughout the content. It's really helpful if you can share them as you have them so we can kind of group things together and try and get ahead of it um, rather than oftentimes later in the event we get a whole influx of um, engagement. So we want to make sure to capture your questions if you have them. 
So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Before I pass things over to Dr. G, I wanted to take a moment to introduce him for those who might be new to the group. Um, and just as always, express our sincere, sincere gratitude for your commitment, Dr. G, to this Lean Into Allyship Initiative and all of the work that you do. Um, Dr. G is the president, founder, and visionary for the nonprofit Nehemiah, the Center for Urban Leadership Development. Their vision is to engage the greater Madison community to empower African-American individuals, families, and communities to bring about hope, transformation, and justice. Nehemiah's work focuses on five core areas, including education, economic development, incarceration, family and community wellness, and leadership and capacity development. Dr. G has 35 years of experience in this space, serving as an advisor to leaders across the world, and his efforts have included educating, coaching, and mobilizing white allies um, in much part to the work here through um, Justified Anger that we are so honored to get to participate with. So welcome, Dr. G. And I will let you take it away. All right, Samantha, thank you so much. And good evening, everyone. It's so great um, to be here and to be um, in this space. Um, I have really enjoyed uh, the Lean Into Allies um, opportunities and the fact that um, AJ and Daniel and Samantha and Lauren from, from Generator and others. I hate when I start mentioning names and I start forgetting about people. And of course, my, my team like Don and, and Eli and so many others. Um, thank you for just helping to make this uh, a reality and a possibility, a place where people come together to lean in because we can be better and stronger um, together. Uh, my team had this, uh, so I'm very, very excited about this. We wanted to do something different and exciting for the end of the year. We wanted to have a chance to chat with folks who are influencers in their own rights. Um, folks who can, can help us to learn about their leadership journey by telling us a little bit about their stories, those who influence them, what keeps them motivated and how they um, attack obstacles. And I've had a chance to know them in varying ways over varying years um, and I've been enriched by them. And so I have some questions for them but I just want you all just to know that you're in for a treat um this evening uh, i'm gonna you know we often have information uh, sometimes when i'm speaking people will read these beautiful um biographical bits of information on me um but sometimes it'll be fun just to say this is what i would love this room to know about me so as i speak real generally i'm going to in introduce each of our panelists tonight and just ask them just to take like 15 or 20 seconds and say there's a room full of people many of them don't know you what would you love them to know about you. So hint, hint, I'm giving you guys a little, this is a little heads up. Um, I have, of the three panelists, I've known um, Ms. Kendra Whipple um, short amount of time. Um, we have, we met each other because of the work between um, her job and our, and our organization in Nehemiah, which for American Family Insurance. She is a recent graduate of our Justified Anger Leadership Institute. And so I got a chance to, to know her more through this area. I have appreciated her voice, um, her insight, um, her strength, and um, her desire to really go about empowering the community in some real unique ways. And so um, I've, I've just have really enjoyed that. And so Ms. Kendra, I'm going to give you Take up to a whole minute. You can be liberal tonight, you know, at the time. But just because I'm going to get into some questions. But what would you love? What would you like for the folks in this room to just to know about you before? You know, I'm going to do this with each person. What would you like for them to know about you? Hobbies, title, where you grew up. What would you like for them to know? Um. So I guess we can. I can incorporate it all. You gave me a whole 60 seconds. So I think okay. I, can, I can tell it all. So um, I work at American Family Insurance. I've actually been there 23 years. And so I am a director in our commercial farm ranch area. So if anybody out there has a small business and you're looking for insurance, come talk to me. Um, I can get you hooked up in the right space uh, for that. So um, I was actually born here in Madison, Wisconsin on a visit. Um, when my mother came to see my sis her sister, um, but then after 
Ward spent a lot of my formative years in Decatur, Illinois, and then I moved back here to Wisconsin, and I was like a bunch of other people that was like, as soon as I graduate, I'm leaving here. So fast forward 23 years, 24 years later, and I'm still here and a happy Sun Prairie resident. So I love the Madison community. I love its potential. I love the people that are here. So I don't see myself moving anytime soon. Um, what I would say, what about me I want everybody to know is that I am a continuous learner. I love learning things. Behind my name is Alphabet Soup, um, as I like to tell people, because if there's a topic I don't know, I usually dive in, so uh, feet first, so I can uh, wade through the waters and learn more about the, the topic. So I would have to say that, and then I'm a relationship person. I am one of those people that you meet, and I assume that everybody I meet, I'm going to be friends with, and so, um, which sometimes much to my husband's chagrin, we go place, and I'm, I'm going to make a friend there, so. <laughs> Oh, Kendra, that is great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to come back to you a little bit later for some, for some more questions. Next, I want to introduce Aaron Hicks, who's a member um, of my Nehemiah team. He is, um, he coordinates and leads our, our, and facilitates our men's discussion group, which is called Man Up. I actually met Aaron when he was a participant in the Man Up um, uh, program when he returned back to our community um, from, from being away. Um, he is also a graduate of our Justified Anger Leadership Institute, um, and I've just watched this gentleman grow in, in, in so many ways. I'm really proud to know him as a colleague and as a staff member. And so, Aaron, I'm going to ask you, we have one minute, young man. What would you love for this audience to know about you that they may not know, young man? Um, I just want people to know that probably I'm actually I'm really simple. Um, I'm probably one of the most simplest people you'll ever meet. Uh, I don't need much, not a, you know, just, just keep, I just try to keep my life real simple. Um, and I have a big heart and, um, the word that I want to throw out to the group collectively is liberation. And I'll leave oh. it at that. <laughs> oh, snap, Aaron, snap. Um, and then the third of our, of our guests tonight is, uh, Miss Kirby Mack. Um, Ms. Kirby Mack has been a part of the Madison community, um, probably for most of her, for adult life. Um, many people, you know, know the fact that she's got a beautiful family, great husband, beautiful children. Her son played football at Wisconsin, but they forget that her dad, that his dad played football too. And Ms. Kirby, I think you all can, both came in from Chicago. So you all were childhood sweethearts, I believe. Yes. And so you've watched Madison from so many perspectives, a community leader, I became really aware of her work as the president of, uh, of our NAACP here in Madison. She worked as a city's affirmative action director. And as she reminded me recently, I sometimes forget that she was also uh, Governor Jim, Jim Doyle appointee um, 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 as, a, as a manager in state government because I interacted with her more um, as a city's affirmative action um, director that I forgot that she, that she had a 14 year stint with state government as well. She has been one of the trustees, probably one of the longest serving trustees in Nehemiah's history. And today was her last board meeting. I'm, I'm sad about that because as I wrote her in a card this morning, she has had my back and my organization's back for decades. And I am eternally indebted to her for that sense of love. Um, there's hardly anywhere you can go in Madison where you have not heard her name or been touched by her influence. And she's going to have so much wisdom to share with us. And so, Miss Kirby, if you could just take a minute and just let um, the audience know something about you that they may not know, ma'am. Well, I don't know, Alex. I think you've kind of captured it all with your introduction. <laughs> I um, I am originally from Chicago, born and raised, uh, lived there uh, all my life uh, until I became an adult when I uh, married my high school sweetheart and moved to Madison and uh, went to college in in uh, Chicago at uh, Northeastern Illinois University and then came to Madison and went to school here for my uh, graduate degree in policy analysis and public administration. And that's why I'm so, I think, involved in, in, um, in matters of the community is that my father was an advocate and, and uh, he had two things he wanted me to remember is to make sure that uh, I stayed involved in the community and that I got a good education and both of them have served me well. You know, my mother taught me about uh, the values of, of, of ethics and morals, and that's why uh, 
it's so it was so important that when I became uh, when I graduated from college and went into uh, government that I kept those values as community, community service, and, and making sure I maintain a high level of ethics and those around me make sure they maintain a high level of ethics and morals. Because in government you can get lost and you can forget um, what you're there for and who you're there to serve. And I, I guess um, as I've um, been in Madison for so long and matured as I raised my, my children here, uh, which I'm so proud of. They've done extremely well in education. My name is uh, in the district. Jeff is at, uh, first vice president of Park Bank and Nisha works for the United Nations in IT. I think I'm so uh, uh, impressed by the fact that this is a good school district. It is a top university. They've all uh, attended there at one time or another. And um, but I, I see the struggles of our people in this city and I would consider myself an advocate's advocate is that I know uh, in government, uh, it's, uh, it's not as it seems. <laughs> There's a lot more behind the, the curtains and, uh, and I, I serve the community and I wanna bridge the gap between the community and government and policymakers. That's, that's great, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kirby. I'm gonna bring all of the um all the panelists on screen, if we can, or highlight them. Are we able to do that? You know, you all, the opportunity that we have tonight is, is a little broader. You often will get a chance to hear from me, but the beauty of having a panel like this is that you get to hear some reoccurring themes um, in the lives of people, and you get to hear about their individual stories. You get someone who's a veteran, a leader like Ms. Kirby, um, yeah, who works in who worked in government as a as a, a public servant, then also um, Ms. Whipple. You get someone who's worked in corporate America and AmFam for 23, 24 years, which is amazing. Then you get a young man like Aaron, who's overcome so many things in his life, that, like many of us have, but is using um, those experiences to help him to serve others. And I want you just to hear things through their lives, and we have the opportunity to really share and receive some of the authentic insight through their experiences. And so. I'm wondering if we can, if you could just reflect for just a moment, um, team, to talk a little bit about um, an influence and an obstacle um, that shaped you in becoming who you are. Because although you may not see this in yourselves or say this, I'll take liberty to say it, you're impressive and our community is so lucky to have you. The work that I'm engaged in is to keep folks like you all in the community because you are such a reminder to our children mm -hmm. that we can succeed and overcome these obstacles. And if you just wanna take an, an obstacle and say, come back to me about the, about, um, about the influence um, or just take one of them, um, that's fine too. But whoever would like to jump in first to either talk about an obstacle um, and a, 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 a source of inspiration, um, someone who really influenced you to make a difference and become who you are. Mm. Maybe. Ladies. I'm sorry, what'd you say? I said ladies. <laughs> well, I would oh. say an obstacle uh, I found in government is, and something that, that, that still bothers me today is that we're still the first. We're still the only one and we're the first. And I would hope that uh, we're able to, to, to network with others who have been there so that the obstacle uh, that we had and the hurdles that we had to jump over that others don't have to do that. And that they'll have a, 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 a easier road in, in the, um, whether it be in private sector and public sector, working in the community, but that we network better with each other. So that's been an obstacle. I know when I first became a firm of action director, the first thing I did is went around and spoke with all the other black, if you will, affirmative action officers to find out how to do my job. Mm -hmm. And was was Mayor Soglin, was he was he uh, was he mayor when you when you yes. started in that position? Yes, yes. Kirby. And how many black yes. affirmative action directors had were, were in that role before you? There were quite a um, well, as affirmative action director with the city, I would work with the state government. So I was in, in affirmative action in both state and, the, and in the city. So uh, in the state, that's where you could find at least three or four. And that was a good number, but that was the position that Blacks held. If you went into 
uh, corporate America, even now, you know, you're the diversity inclusion officer. You know, you're not the budget director, but you know, you're you're in, <laughs> in affirmative action and diversity and equal opportunity, and that's fine because we need to be there. That's important. That's critical. But um, th there there were a few, but that was a lot. That was a lot. And then uh, that was in Madison, and then there were uh, uh, individuals in the in um, Milwaukee and in Wa you know, Wauwatosa and some other places where, you know, we would find one or two there. Do, do, you, do you think we have as many people in those roles who are Black decades yeah. later? Today? No, no. I, I know for the state you don't, we don't. In the city, yeah. we might have, we're doing, I think, a little better. But in but state today. government, absolutely not. If from based on what I've seen and what I've heard right. from other people who are working, who work for the state currently. Sure. Sure, and we'll come back around for some um, um, to talk about um, folks who really influenced you. But um, Ms. Kendra, any any obstacles that you care to share, either personally in your life or professionally, that you've had to overcome to help you to become the the strong um, black woman you are? Yeah, I would um, say the temptation to be inauthentic mm -hmm. is a is an obstacle. Um, that I've had to come to terms with. So being at the company for a very long time, which I'm sure American Family is not unique. It's not like any other, you know, um, it's not unlike any other corporations that you you will find anywhere. But there was, you know, we've changed over the the decades, like I'm sure a lot of companies have, right? And, and mindsets have changed and approaches to business and employee relations have changed. But I remember when I first started with the company, there was the expectation that I acted a certain way or that I presented a certain way. Um, and I grew up in a very strong, outspoken family. And so you just don't ride with everything. And if something doesn't sit well with you, um, you do it. And I was I was brought up in a household where, where you can um, talk to people about things that don't sit well with you, but you do it respectfully. And I would have to say in the beginning of my career, it was that Knowing now, my my feeling is if I can go to a black mother and tell her about something I'm unhappy with and walk away and live to tell the story, I've done it well. So when going into corporate America and you know being told at, at certain times that I shouldn't speak up or that I didn't need to have an opinion about something, or that you know most of the room agrees, so you should just go with it, or just things that didn't sit well with me. And I feel like over in my younger years in my career, it was a struggle to continue to be who I was and present myself as Kendra and, and remembering, you know, the words of my mothers and my aunties and my grandmothers and my father just in the, at the end of the day, you got to be able to look at yourself and you have to be able to be proud and accepting of who you are as a person. And so there have been, you know, we may have an opportunity to get into it tonight, but there have been times in, in my career where it was, it was really a decision point where I can either be who I am and stand up for who I, what I believe is right, you know, or I can just go with the tide, right? And do what everybody else is doing because that's the easier route. And, and I have to say that I've been um, blessed enough to make the right choice and, and always go the route that I felt like we needed to go. And it has, you know, and at times it's been putting it all in God's hands. So um, without, you know, taking up too much time, I, I had situations at work where I decided to stand up for what I believed was right and uh, was told that I wouldn't have a job by the end of the week. And so putting it in, in, in the hands of God, I did what I was supposed to do. And the day before was my last day at a company or at the company that I had been with for you know over a decade. Someone reached out to me and said, I heard that this was happening and oh no, here, here's where you need to report on Monday. And for me, that was, that was affirmation that being who you are and stick in doing the right thing and, and stepping out for the right reason is is a good thing to do. So that's one of those lessons, you know, although it happened more than, you know, a decade ago, I feel like that was that was affirmation that being who you are, being authentic has value. Wow. And do you think it was a perception um, in, inside the various organizations where you've worked that those who are um, inauthentic are more readily promoted? Oh, absolutely. You know, the the more you can nod your head in some circles, mm -hmm. the the faster, you know, you, you get more opportunities, you get, you know, um, bigger raises, you get different titles. So absolutely, the, the pressure is definitely there. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Hicks, I'm going to bring you in in just a moment, but I want to I want to ask you something, Ms. Kirby, and back to you, um, uh, Kendra. Um, there's a perception 
that um, if you're strong, intelligent, uh, uh, black, female, I'm just speaking specifically to you all, this pales, uh, this goes for men too, but in your case, female, that corporate America is just sort of starving uh, for you. So people of color right now have it easy, but I don't know that people understand that in addition to all of the other things that you all are talking about, you've got to still be there before your white counterparts, stronger than your white counterparts, making sure that your white supervisors aren't taking credit for the work that you've done. And so is it is it true um, that it is not easy with the perception of affirmative action and opportunities and equal opportunity, that it is not just easy for people of color. There's a perception that if you're in a key place like you all are, that somehow someone just turned their heads and just said, you know, we need diversity. So we're just gonna put somebody in this spot. You have to be competent and strong to be successful in the way you all have been. Can you elaborate on that? Ms. Vancouver? <laughs> <laughs> I could, yes, ma'am, I can go first. Um, I would have to say that all of that is true. You know, so it's been the rare situation where I have worked for um, a boss that had more education or more depth or breadth of experience mm -hmm. than I had. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, it's been very rare. So you show up and, and you're being led by someone, you know, who, and, and there's lots of reasons why leaders get chosen, right? So that's not the judgment here, but, you know, you're being led by someone and you're thinking, wow, okay. You know, hey, it is what it is. We're just gonna gonna do our best to put it forward. But you're right. And and over my career, I've been told that I'm the diversity hire, and you know, we needed someone who looked like me in order to you know be in that role because the others weren't. Um, but you're right. We show up earlier. We work harder. I work weekends. You know, it's just what you do. Um, I work nights, and it's just what you do. And I feel like um, that is an expectation because those are the things that get noticed. You know, and, and while others may clock out at 4, 35 o'clock, you know, haven't seen a Friday in many years, um, I just don't feel like that is the that is the the way that I can behave and how I can show up. Alex, I think while, while so much has changed, so much is, is still the same. I think it hurts me the most when I counsel uh, individuals as well as my own children on how to manage the workplace. They're, they're receiving the same level of discrimination and invisibility as, as I did uh, when, when I started off my career. Don't think for one minute it's easy for an African-American today as it was before. I think they, these, these young people are going through the exact same things that we have gone through. Don't, they, they're not invited to certain meetings. They come in with management titles in their positions and, and are not shown the budget are not shown how to manage a budget or operate a budget or understand the budget, even when it's their own budget. Mm. I have seen this over and over again. So when you ask the question, I had to calm myself down for a moment before answering. Cause I, I you know, Fannie Mae Lou Hamer, sick and tired of being sick and tired. It, they're going through the exact same thing. So there's no, no hands up for, uh, um, uh, blacks and being a woman, it, it's it, sometimes even worse than um, than for men. But but in men, in certain places, it's it's okay. It's it's respect. They they understand you're a man. But when you're a woman, uh, I think it's even more challenging because they have so so many stereotypical uh, ideas of what a woman should. But you know, you should be at home with your children. You know, I remember when well, I, I had so many stories like that, but I'll, but I'll just leave it there. But no, things had, they're, they're the same as they were back in, in the day when I was uh, affirmative action director managing uh, managers as to how they are to, to respect and treat their employees. You know, and Ms. Mack, I think um, you bring up something else. That, another thought for me too, is it's the microaggressions. Mm -hmm. Right. That as the, you know, you're showing up to work black, you're showing up to work female, you're showing up to work as a mother, a sister, a daughter, you know, all of those other things and other hats that you wear. But we yes. do have to be cautious of the microaggressions, too, um, that happen not only on a racial level, but also on a gender level, you know, too. So there is that that pressure of, you know, when I'm in a meeting, I have to be mindful of how many times I agree to take the notes, you oh. know, because I don't I have to be cautious of 
how easy it is for people to keep asking you and asking you. You're like, I'm I'm the director, not the administrative assistant. But the the that goes in comes into play um, when you talk about not being invited in meetings. You know, you it takes a lot of brain energy when you're sitting there trying to figure out is this just humans being humans, or is this you know, something related to my gender, or is this something related to my race, you know, and it, and it takes up a lot of brain space to do that, you know, something as simple as like, oh, okay, the PowerPoint for, you know, all the contributors for it, or the leadership team that's there, and, and my manager is listed, but all the other directors, you know, are listed in something, but for some reason, you know, when it came to my department, the manager gets, gets the billing, and so it's, it's those things that take up a lot of, of energy, and a lot of time, and, and it makes it so, um, Dr. G, that the, the workplace is still different for us. And Kendra, I would, I would say it's both. It is your race and your gender. <laughs> yes. Mr. Hicks, how about, how about an obstacle yeah. that you had to face and overcome that helps you to become um, uh, a pace setter or the pace setter you are, young man? Yeah, I, I, I still I'm actually still fighting to get over this obstacle and it's really just me getting out of the way of me. Mm. Uh, more than anything, uh, I've I've allowed myself to operate out of fear um, since I was little. So um, and I mean, to this day, like that's that's, you know, that's probably been the biggest obstacle in my life. With that being said, though, uh, I'm learning <laughs> daily how to get out of my way. Um, I'm becoming more conscious of that. Um, and I think because of that, it allows me to help the individuals I'm around because I get it, I see it. I had to live it, I had to walk in it. Um, but I know I'm not gonna stay there. That's not an option either, uh, so. Are there things that, that cause you to get in your own way? Because I don't think we wake up and just want to be in our way, but are there certain things that caused you made you more prone to be in your own way? Um, probably just doubting my own abilities, trusting, just really trusting me that it's okay, um, that you got this, that I can do it, uh, those type of things. Mm -hmm. You know, I, initially when you asked the question, my thought was incarceration, in, just knee jerk, but sure. But 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 I understand that incarceration is not limited to a building. It's a state of mind. It may be a multitude of people who may never go to a prison, but are very much incarcerated. Mm. You all, um, audience members, I want you to know that um, I spotted leadership potential in Aaron. Um, my first time meeting him, he he talked more than I did in the group I was facilitating. So that's why I ended up hiring him full time to facilitate that group, and he's replaced me. But he did so with, with insight and a lot of candor, um, and I was impressed. When I created a leadership track for him, his Department of Corrections agent withheld him from the program because they asked me, who do I think I am telling him that he can be a leader? Now, my graduate work is in leadership development. She asked, she, she, oh, I had to catch myself a record. I almost said that. She asked me, she, no, I wasn't going to cuss. I wasn't going to cuss. Um, she asked me, she asked me, who do I think I am filling his head with the fact that he could be a leader? Now, knowing quite well, he could do her job. He could, he could do her job. I get the influence he's had on people's lives um, compared to hers. But with everything he's been through, with our programming, we had to not justify why he was seeing himself as a leader why would we begin to train him so that he would see himself as a leader? And she said she fears that if he saw himself as a leader, he'd take it. It would not work his program if he saw himself as a leader. And so when you talk about getting out of your own way, uh, Mr. Hicks, I feel like that's taking such great ownership because one of the things I've known about you and that I respect is that you can call out a system. You will call out a system in a minute. You will say, it ain't broke. It's the way it's supposed to work. Stop saying that this is broke. It ain't broke. Um, um, you like, I remember you saying that, but at the same time, you'll come on here and you will not blame your agent. You will not blame the illness that your mother had or being in foster. You won't blame those things. You'll talk about decisions you made. And that level of responsibility is what makes a person a pace setter. That level of responsibility is what makes you such a valued member of my team and such a great, um, 
um, asset to this community that you're able to look at all the things that happen to and around you, but you take responsibility for it. Uh, and all those around you saw it, but your agent didn't. And in spite of all of that, you were taken out of the program. When you're able to be released and be cleared, we still trained you as a leader, hired you as, as a leader. But I just want folks to understand that pace setting is getting out of your own way, mm. but you're in your own way while others are still hurling tomatoes at you and saying, you can't do it, you shouldn't do it, you're formerly incarcerated, you're a woman, you're black, you're poor, and that we do get in our own way. because we, But we have learned to rise above the, the noise on the outside, but let's not make any kind of mistake. That's not the first time someone said you weren't qualified to be trained or taken seriously or developed. And in the midst of all of that, you still allowed others to speak of your strength, of your attributes, and you overcame in light of that. And I, to me, that's what makes you a pace setter. No, I appreciate that. I, I really do. Especially coming from you. And I still need my lunch. <laughs> no. And so the next, yes, yes, Aaron, yes, yes. We have the same birthday, so we try to get together uh, uh, each year in doing in doing um, doing our lunches. Um, Miss Kendra, what would you say to the twenty three year old Jew that was entering into um, the the real world, the corporate world, the predominantly white world? What would you say to you now? I mean, what do you know now that you would that you would say to that person to help her um, maybe experience fewer scars or um, hard knocks in her in her career and life? Oh, I would say, don't be afraid to be great. Mm. That's what I would tell. Do not be afraid to be great. I think um, I've always been a high achiever. So it was an expectation, you know, from from my family that you you excel um, at the things that you try. But when I entered into the workplace, there was a certain drive, right, that you just can't get rid of because it's just innate in who you are. Um, but I always had that. But I have, as I reflect on kind of my younger 23, 24, you know, the beginning of my career, it was way too much focus on trying to make other people not feel uncomfortable. Mm, you know, yes, and, and, yes. and not make other people feel like you were running circles around them, that I held myself back. And it it comes with a certain unhappiness. That's the trade off, you know, for it is is that it comes with a certain unhappiness when you're holding things back because you've seen what happens when you speak your mind and you have this great idea, you know, and, and how certain people react to it. So my my younger self, I would I would say, don't be don't hold yourself back from being great. Um, I would probably add one other thing to that that I think just comes with maturity, right? So, um, which is understand what your risk, what the trade off is. When you make one decision, articulate for yourself what you're giving away if you make that decision. So, there have been a, a and it's one of the things that I, I teach my children now is that before you make a decision, start with what you're risking. Um, and, and it just came back. Quickly, it came back to slap me in the face yesterday because I was almost late for a meeting from taking my daughter to an appointment on the west side of Madison, which is quite far from our place, and she's a new driver. And so we were going, I was going to be late for my meeting, and I said, could you please go faster? And she says, so wait, you want me to risk getting my driver's license when I'm supposed to by getting pulled over so that you can make a meeting that you're not leading? I was like, just drive the car. Just try, try <laughs> but but um, it, but if I could reflect on a twenty three year old self, that would be that would be me. That's good, Miss Kirby. I'm going to ask you a slightly different question. We have many folks who are listening who are learning what allyship is. Not all of them are ready for it, and that's not being judgmental. Some are just beginning to lean in to understand what the true issues are in your illustrious career. Is there a story or an example you can share of someone who wasn't black, who demonstrated that they were a true ally for you? Oh, <clears throat> sure. I would say uh, the city of Madison, when I was the affirmative action director, one of my staff was a, um, a gay young white female 
who was, um, uh, as we would say, a ride or die. She was really a, a supporter who understood the um, government as well as communities, various communities outside of the government that I was not affiliated with or was not associated with and didn't understand. And um, she, um, she was just extremely, extremely competent, extremely helpful. She, and I'll tell you a story about her is that she had an African-American female who was under, uh, under her direction. One of her staff members who was not um, doing the work as well as we all thought that that person could do. And she kept, you know, so when, when performance evaluation would come around, she would tell me that certain things weren't done because this African-American female wasn't doing her job. So, um, so I had to impress upon her that I'm, I'm grading you. <laughs> so you're not getting things done. So you need to, to, to work with the sister, the African-American female to help her get her work done. Cause I'm going to help you get your work done by telling you what I need from you and what I need you to do and what I need you to produce. And, but, but this was an ally. This is a, a, a woman who, who did turn it around and, and started working with the, cause you know, you're not helping us when you don't, as I alluded to earlier, teach us the budget. You're not helping us when you don't teach us how to pr properly prepare uh, an agenda and, um, or, or speak to, to uh, various audiences that you have to speak to. Some of our meetings are internal, some are with external, some are with higher ups. So, you know, if you're not helping us and coaching us along the way, you're not helping us. And that's what I was telling her. You're not helping her, you're holding her back. You're rendering her from being successful. And guess what? You're gonna be unsuccessful as well because you're not getting certain work done. So anyway, that, that helped her, you know, um, and she in turn appreciated that. And in turn was just a great ally for me. And I think now she's running one of the departments in the city as we speak. Wow. Ms. Chicks, how about you? Have you had an example of, um, of, a, of a white ally? was really partnered with you um, in, in some way. And if I could, but no, I'll, I'll leave that question. You know, no, 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 you go ahead, you go ahead, you go ahead. Well, I was thinking particularly, because we always tell these, I always tell these, <laughs> these awful stories about your agents, because you've had some awful agents. Um, <laughs> but, Amen. Yeah, Amen. But, 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 your, but your last, your last agent, he, he struck me as an ally that that's what you want an agent to do in the Department of Corrections, to believe in someone that they can be better. And so, um, you know, I, I think that it's important, you know, it's a season of giving. So I want to give some examples of where people have done some good work, but could you just, you don't have to give specifics about like his name or anything, but can you, can you reflect upon some things that he did as a good agent that helped you as you were, as you were getting off of paper, off of, off of, um, off of parole, off of probation, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, he was yeah, definitely. He, um, I mean, he, he would just communicate with me more than anything else. Um, he gave me my space. Um, but he was, he was always he, more than anything else. He was always motivating me, uh, letting me know, you know, this is, you made it. It's at the end now. So, you know, and actually, uh, I don't even know. I think, I don't know. A few months after I was done with um, any supervision, after I was done with all of that, he had reached out to me. He was like, I no longer work for the Department of Corrections, but, you know, I just wanted to keep in contact with you, see how you're doing, you know, and just let you know, man, I'm, I'm proud of you. So that was huge. That's I, I, I don't think I ever heard of nothing like that. So I, I know it, I'm sure it happens, but I ain't heard of it yet. So that was that was that was. That was stellar. You know, you know, Aaron, for you to be able to motivate other people, and reentry work is a lot about motivation. It's not browbeating people, but it's, a, it's, it's about motivating people to believe that they can do more, have more, and become who they were before they got that name or that, num that number by the state of Wisconsin. That's right. Before That's that right. identity was stepped away. Um, so what keeps you motivated so that you're in a position to motivate other people? And I'm going to ask yes. you, Ms. Kirk, into that as well. What, what, puts, what positions you... So that you're full enough to motivate other people. Yeah, it's um, you know, certain stuff is on you, and then certain and certain stuff is in you, and I think that's just it's just 
It's in me. I, I can't even stop it. Even when I feel like I'm tired, I don't even want to do this no more. If I even if I attempted to do that, it wouldn't even work because immediately it just come out. Anyways, um, I understand the power of struggle, but I also understand that these things that we're going through is all temporary. Right. And just giving people a different lens to look at a different perspective. A lot of times we be so stuck on the woe is me and we don't always look at like, you know, you know, actually, this is building some character actually is teaching you how to be patient, right? It's teaching you more than what you thought. And a lot of times we don't want to go through nothing because it hurts, but that's the very thing that's, that's, that's shaping and molding you. Right. And that's what gives me the passion to do what I do. Um, because I know what it's like. I know what it feels like. Um, but I also know that being stuck there is not an option. That just ain't on the table. And if, I mean, any person around me, it don't matter who it is, black, white, blind, cripple, or crazy, it don't matter. Um, I'm going to encourage them that it, it don't have to stay this way, whatever it is. It don't never have to stay this way. Um, and I just believe that in the core of my being. That's how I'm wired. Um, and I don't think that's ever going to change in any way, shape, or form. Um, I just believe in the impossible. I believe in the impossible. Um, and I believe that people desire, for my word for the day again, people desire to be liberated. You know, all this old, just, you know, this temporary, I'm free for a minute and I'm not. No, people want to be, they want liberation. And I think it's our agenda and our objective to bring that to the table. Wow. Right? That's, that's powerful. That's powerful. Hey, Miss, Miss Kendra, in one of our discussions, and I may, I don't want to, I, I don't want to pry or bring up something you don't want to talk about. So you're able to say, yeah, oh, we're not talking about. but we talked about um, an ally who's white, who's really a part of your family. Now, am I getting that story? Am I remembering? My can, grandma. Can, your grandma, can you just, because I remember when you told me that, I looked at you and I said, her grandma ain't white. You know, you know, black people know how to see stuff. Like we look, <laughs> I, look I quickly looked at her nose, her chin, like her grandma, what's she talking about? Her grandma ain't white. And um, uh. so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, only grandma people spot, I ever know. Black people, yeah, black people spot. So tell me, tell me about grandma because I love that story. <laughs> yes, you have to let me know if I'm I'm missing it, uh, leaving out a, a part that you wanted to share. But um, yeah. So my my grandma. She became your grandma. Like tell how she became your grandma. Yeah. So so my mother's mother, um, passed away when my mother was six, and so they lived in Mississippi, and so there were seventeen children. So as you can imagine, my grandfather was was working hard, doing, you know, trying to take care of, of the household. Um, but prior to him remarrying, um, there, there, you know, there was all these kids there. And so there happened to be a program um, that was actually connecting white families in the north with black families in the south. And the Ooh. whole goal of that program was to start giving black children exposure to the North and giving white families exposure to people in the blouse. So basically it was bringing the two cultures together was the aim of the program. And so my mother's older sister um, got connected with a family in Wisconsin and, you know, they met my aunt and, and, or what will be my grandmother met my aunt and was like, oh, she had four kids, was newly divorced. And she was like, I want that for my children to have that exposure. So they actually connected with my mother. And so then for summers, my mother would go um, and visit my grandmother up north in Wisconsin, and, and they would take family trips, just like you see in the movies, you know, they all get in the car and drive around to different places in the country. Um, but my grandmother, who, you know, was very much into civil rights, was very, I mean, the, the first conversations about culture and race I had with her. And so, and she was just a very open-minded um, supportive woman. So she's actually um, Jewish by ethnicity and Baha'i by religion. So it was my first exposure too with like all the pieces like not fitting together with what you think somebody was supposed to be. Um, and she was an absolute spitfire. You know, she believed in me only having black dolls because she felt like I needed to have that representation for myself. Like my mother tells a story where she had to tell her about how things happen in the South because when they were, they stayed a couple of days at one pickup and they stayed a couple of days in, in Mississippi and they went to a beach that was supposed to be integrated. 
And so when they were there playing around with the other kids and whatever in the beach, I think the word got out that there was these white people at the beach and, you know, were they safe? And the police officer came down and they had the dogs and they were trying to scare off the black people to do. And my grandmother, who was all of five feet, cursed out the the police officer (laughs) and told him what she would do to him with what was in her trunk if he didn't leave them kids alone. And so, and my mother was like, I had to pull her aside and say, you gonna get all us killed, like y'all too. You need to calm (laughs) calm down, but he's just been a fighter (laughs) since day one. So I grew up with somebody like that I loved and cared about, but somebody who also walked the talk. So yeah, she was absolutely the first ally before I knew it was a word. Kendra, I love that. Is she is she still living? Is she? Is she, she is. She is. She is living her best life. She does summers up north in Wisconsin and, and winters in Puerto Vallarta. So, so she knows your kids. So she's had a chance to meet your kids. Oh, they, yep. That is Grandma Joan. They, <laughs> and they call her crazy Grandma Joan. We love her. She crazy. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. My goodness. Let me ask this, because we want to open up for some general Q&As. You all have just been a joy. Um, on my podcast this season, I've been talk- talking about things that bring us Black joy, things that we do that are unapologetic, that's rooted in our culture and our cultural identity. And when we do them, it makes us to feel um, more whole and more complete. And I'd just love to ask you all um, what that might be. For me, I'll just say this to give you a minute to think about it. It's my podcast. I get to have Black guests to talk about Black things, to say Black stuff, and people lean in because they get to vicariously experience some of that Black joy um, and understanding that I feel no pressure to assimilate, that I can be who I am, and that that brings me great joy and healing. So I'm curious, whatever whatever order you like to go, um, and I think in about three minutes or so, we're going to go to some general questions, but any of you have anything um, that you're doing that that's particularly fits into what you might call Black joy? I would say since I retired, everything I do... <laughs> fits in the black joy. <laughs> I'm with Blacks for Political and Social Action. My son has a JFMJ Academy for youth. We uh, uh, work with youth during the summer to make sure they maintain African-American youth taught by African-American teachers. Um, I wrote a Christian book and I'm working with, this is my second book on um, for, for children. And uh, I'm working with this, um, with my illustrator. And the first picture he showed me of a, of a black female that he was, you know, drawing, I told him, I said, oh, no, no, no. Let me show you what some black females <laughs> look like in, uh-huh. in, in, in this day and age and back in the day. This is what they look like. But, um, of course, in working with my sorority, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, we work um, as a, you know, as a, in the community with an various, everywhere we go, <laughs> we're doing something that relates to, to, to children and to uh, the health of, of Black Americans. And, um, and then of course our Black Excellence Campaign. Yes. Where we work, where we're working with, um, with, <laughs> with Pastor G to, inc- to, uh, to receive donations from the Black community so that, is, what is Alex doing? <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm showing you all the building. Okay, I'm so I'm sorry, I was pointing to the building. Oh, okay. Oh, you're pointing to the. Okay, we'll make sure we let everyone know. Yeah. So, um, and we, uh, along with uh, the lady G, she and I co-chair Black Excellence. So, uh, that's a that's a, a, a initiative that we're extremely proud of. We raised over fifty thousand dollars in what two months or yes. three months max. But um, so really proud of uh, those initiatives. And then I have my own consulting firm now that I, um, I work to uh, counsel individuals as well as uh, write grants and create programs in the community. I love it. So yeah, Ms. everything Kim- I'm doing right now is Black. <laughs> I love it. Ms. Black, Black, Black. Ms. what are you doing that, 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 that fits under the head you of know, Black? I- I am glad you asked me that question because this is a follow-up to a discussion that we had when I was in the um, program. Um, So I would have to say the transcultural, we talked about my my desire and my interest in helping out transcultural families, um, especially those that adopt Black children um, and specifically with help with hair care. And so um, I have explored that. We don't have the business set up yet, but um, I've been able to dive into that more deeply. And 
I have to say that the like I knew I would like it. I knew I liked it when I dabbled in it. But um, now me providing hair care and tutorials and home visits to help people who've adopted, you know, black children like that has given me so much joy in being able to problem solve with, you know, with with those parents and you you see the families and you know that they've got all the love in the world to give, you know, and and they are holding that baby and and would protect them with it, with their life as any other parent would. But there is just that piece um, that's missing with that. And, and having grown up in my formative years in, in predominantly white spaces, hair matters in how you, you feel about yourself and, and, you know, what other people think of you matters. And, and especially when it comes to hair care. So um, being able to partner with families to to show them how to care for black hair to, you know, and I've even started mixing my own formulas and, and oh. oils and all of that stuff that are being really well received. Um, but to like, you know, get texts from those parents of like, oh my gosh, like the difference it made like in three days or, you know, oh my gosh, she was scratching her head and pulling out her hair. And it's, I was so worried and I was going to take her to the doctor. I was like, that baby don't need no doctor, her scalp dry. So this is what you, this is what you need to do. I did not realize how much um, joy that would feel, fill me with. So I, I appreciate you, Dr. G, for, for challenging me. That was a tough conversation. You asked me some hard questions, um, but it made me really think about it. And, and I'm happy I'm exploring it. I am too. I see the joy in your eyes as you talk about it. I see black joy as you speak about it. Yes. Mr. Hicks, you get to the last. What, what's bringing you black joy right now, young man? Um, more than anything, my daughter. <laughs> oh man, I'm just hanging out with her, spending time. We just, you know, she brings joy to me. Well, I can't even explain it. That's my whole fight to get back out here was to get to her. So, yes. And I love seeing you interact as a father. I love seeing you interact with her as a father and the growth I see in that. So I'm, thank you for not letting anything change and take that away, young man. Hey, um, Samantha, Daniel, um, we have some questions from, from the room. You all, first of all, let me just say, thank you so much. This has just been just refreshing, just hearing your perspectives and you, folks, who, you give me hope in this community um, <clears throat> because you know how to be who you are in your own skin. You know how to reach across the aisle. You know how to reach into other cultures um, and bear the scars that that requires while still being true to who you are. And we are very gifted to have you in Madison. So, um, Mr. Samantha, I'm going to let you just take over with any other questions from the audience, whatever is next. So thank you. Thank you so much, my families. Thank you. Thank you so much. Erin, Miss Kendra, Miss Kirby, thank you so much. That was incredible. The amount of notes that I have, um, I will absolutely be <laughs> diving back in to listen to this again. Um, but thank you so much. That was that was really wonderful. We appreciate all of your authentic, you know, dialogue and and everything that you've shared with us. And we are hoping to just dive in to maybe just a question or two. Um, we are going till about 8.15 tonight, but we wanna make sure to ask um, just a couple questions. So if there's anything you'd like to send through, we can try and um, get to those. But one thing we wanted to make sure to touch on with the three of you um, or whoever would like to take this one is just really to talk about the importance of mental health and you know true holistic wellness in in your efforts and as you continue to lead you know and set the pace and do big bold beautiful things um, it is clear that you have achieved so much in your life right despite numerous obstacles and with the help of influences um, but really we'd love to hear what do you do for self-care to ensure that you are healthy and well enough to keep achieving um, you know and when you aren't focused on on the next big thing um, what brings you what brings you peace and restoration? Oh, it's the Bible for me. <laughs> it, it definitely, um, uh, I, I, I try to abide by the, the principles in the Bible. I, I, I remember when I was in government, uh, I kept a Bible in the right top hand drawer <laughs> of, my, of my office so that when, uh, issues arose, I, I could calm myself and be still and know that I'm here for a reason. It's God that put me here, not anyone in that room or outside of that room. 
and that I'm here to do his work. And that, that, kept, that keeps me, even to this very day, it keeps me uh, on solid ground. I would have to say for me, it is, and this is something I've just learned in the past five years, but um, the wonders that it's done for my mental health and peace of mind is huge. But I have learned the difference between um, a trip and a vacation. And I have learned to take them. Um, I think a lot of us, when we go places, we go on trips and you're seeing this thing and you're seeing that thing and you're going from here and you're going there. And I have learned that vacations are what you need in order to kind of bring yourself back to center, right? When you go someplace and it's whatever scenery you want to see, but the agenda is just you. It's just you. And whatever you feel like doing, whether it's reading, you know, swimming, whatever, whatever it is, but that to me has has really helped. So that's good. I don't tackle both of those things, the Bible and vacation. <laughs> my hope is that <laughs> my hope is to be in Florida before uh before the end of the year. So there you go. You deserve you know, it. Samantha, I want to throw something out. I in September, I started taking tennis lessons. I started going to tennis drills and part of it's for health. Um, but when you're in your late fifties, it's hard to do, if you're not a pickup basketball person, it's hard to do things that are competitive so that you can meet new people and still push yourself. Mm -hmm. I do it three days a week religiously. I finish my zoom calls at five 30 while I'm dressed in my tennis gear. I have trainers at, and I, I feel more focused. I feel like I'm able to let stress go. I push myself but I have not exercised consistently or competitively until, you know, since um, my days, you know, in college and high school track. I love that. That's awesome. For me, it's swimming. Though. I go swimming. Matter of fact, right after this podcast, that's where I'm headed. Oh, <laughs> wow. that, is wow. that is impressive. That is impressive. That is impressive. <laughs> <laughs> that, is. <laughs> that is amazing, uh, Kirby. Uh, we did have, and I know we're running a little tight on time, so I want to combine a couple questions. So Tim, thank you for being so active out there in the, the Q&A in the chat tonight. Um, I want to combine a couple questions. So one of Tim's questions was, you know, what are the signals that you watch for or how do you identify who's truly an ally to the Black community? Um, and then inversely, you know, what, what we'd like to always do at the end of these events is tie it in for those listeners and actions they can take. And there's kind of an open question we wanted to ask about um, just what's an authentic thing that you would ask would be allies, to use your term, Dr. G, would be allies or allies in training to know? What's one thing that you'd want them to take away for what they can do um, to better support the Black community as well? Mm. Um, I, I have a thought. Um, I would have to say the, the first one when you were, it was like, what was the question? Like, how do you know someone is in? Yeah, not, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, what are the signals that you look for? Or how do you actually know someone from maybe a performative ally or says the right things, but someone who's truly an ally um, in that context? Yes. Um, to me, the difference is, is a performative ally comes to the table what they think about something and then they're asking you to confirm, right? It's, a, it's an exercise in confirmation, not an understanding. Um, and I don't know if it was my my good friend, Tim, that asked that question or not, but I definitely- It, it was. It was, okay. <laughs> so um, he would be, if he was on camera, he'd probably be turning red, but he is to me the <laughs> most powerful example of an ally that I've ever met. Um, he comes to, and he asks the questions, what don't I know? which is a powerful question to ask. Um, and then he brings things to me. So he does his own research. He, you know, thinks about the information that he's seeing. He thinks about what his, you know, what his discussion will be with people who don't agree with him. And we actually have discussions about that. So he has brought more articles to me than, than I think I've ever shared with him. I'm like, where did you find that? But like, let's, let's have a discussion about it. So someone who comes comes to the table and having done their, their research, talking about diversity and inclusion and matters that, um, things that matter to the black community can be exhaustive if you're the person who's mm -hmm. always pushing information out. What it What is most helpful and what's most healthy for both parties involved is when that person comes with, hey, I read this and, you know, let's talk about 
you know, what's your perspective on this? I'm going to talk about my perspective on this. And, and the man takes notes and everything. And I'm like, I usually feel, leave feeling rather smart <laughs> dealing with him because he's, he's taking notes on what I say, but um, he's an awesome, awesome example. That's great. Anything to add to that, uh, Aaron or, or Kirby, as far as even maybe the second question about what what's one thing that you would want, you know, would be allies to take away as um, from tonight and how they can better support the Black community? Again, moving from maybe more of saying the right things or trying to ask the right, you know, that one line that you know you're supposed to say to actually being a true ally um, and have that be a takeaway for tonight. For for me, actions speak louder than words. Uh, my my predominantly all my life I've been in government, either on city side, state side, work with you know local governments in the county and municipality. And, and for managers, I, I wanna know who they've hired. I want to know, have you diversified your workforce without me having to come through the door and look at your record and tell you that you haven't and what you plan to do about it? I think it's important that, that you know, pe people, uh, you know, mean well and, 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 you know, as we would say, talk is cheap. I want to see what you've done. What, what are you really uh, doing in the Black community? Uh, do you go to, you know, uh, the, the, oh no, how, you, how about this? Have you contributed to the center? <laughs> Have you, you know, something that the Black community has, has surrounded its arms around and you know that it's something that we need, that we violently need? Have you given? You know, and how many times do we have to, to ask you and you know that this is something that, that we're engaged in, we're involved in? Have you contributed? I, 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 I just, I've seen it so many times throughout my lifetime in government where uh, people say, I can't find black people. I can't find competent people, I can't find. Yes, you can, yes, you can. If you really want to, uh, you will know who to reach out to or you can reach out to people to, to help you. So uh, an ally is someone who um, does what he or she uh, says they're gonna do and, um, and is supportive of the black community in, in many ways than just financially, but in support in the workplace as well. I'm gonna echo all of that, Dan. <laughs> What's that, Aaron? I said I will echo all of that. Perfect. <laughs> Nothing else to add. All right. Perfect. Um, and the one thing that I would add, I think, to to just to to tie into what you said, Kirby. And I know, Dr. G. I always mention this um, when our first meeting in person. To what you said, Kirby. Just be careful as an ally. This is a mistake I made. Is I credentialed myself, Dr. G. You you probably remember. I was like, but I've read these books and I've done this, and yeah, but that. You, I remember you saying, lean in, be, build relationships, get close. And then I, I remember I asked, can you correct me when, I'm, when I say something wrong? And that's when you gave me that advice. And so that was the one thing I'll always remember. Don't credential yourself about what books you've read or who have you talked to? What relationships have you developed? Have you actually understood what the realities of the issues are? Not just what you saw in a, a meme or a, a book or something like that. How about give um, me a list of your names of your black friends <laughs> that you've actually gone to their house and sat at the table. Yeah. Yep. That's yeah. what you ask. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. And I, and I know we are, unfortunately these events go too fast. And so we are at the time that we do want to turn it over to um, Denise. So we're very grateful to have Denise here. She's actually the director of economic innovation and sustainability. And she's actually um, filling in for Haley who is the mobilization uh, intern right now, just to talk through some of the volunteering activities. And so let me share what we'll be talking through here. And she'll kind of walk us through the three pillars of allyship that Dr. G talks about before we wrap up the event. Um, okay, so <laughs> looking at volunteer opportunities, we always wanna think about three, the three pillars, educate, donate and affiliate and for education and Don Thornton's going to be sharing some um, links to what I'm talking about but for the first thing and I'm going to talk more about black history for a new day but we do have a spring session starting in February of 2022 tomorrow from four to five there's a session available about group registration if you'd like your employer to have a group or if you Anyway, if you'd like to be part of a group as opposed to signing up as an individual, there's information there. Um, Thursday evening, you've got White and Wondering. 
And the topic this time is wokeness versus growth and maturity. And those are third Thursdays, I believe, of every month. So um, keep an eye out for those. Uh, jumping to donating, we've got a lot going on. Oh, hang on, hang on, we're gonna back up. <laughs> Forgot about this also. And I think this was pressure from one of our recent participants. We now have a gift certificate available if you want to give someone else um, Black History for a new day. And um, there is a sign up. And what will happen if you sign up is we'll send you an invoice and you'll get a gift certificate with a code on it that you'll give to the recipient. Um, okay. <laughs> also, we're talking more and more about different kinds of groups doing Black History for a New Day. So here's another way. I mentioned a, a group that maybe with your employer, but we're looking at um, other ways to do groups if you're not able to take it as an individual on Monday evenings. So that's another option for people. Um, now, jumping to donate. We've got a lot going on because it's Christmas time and we are looking for help for the Soul Santa event, which is Friday evening. Um, and there are volunteer opportunities. There there's a link that Don is gonna put in the chat, but we need help with the Chris Christmas essentials um, bags. We need help with Soul Santa. We uh, want to drop off supplies to kids to make, um, lost a word. You know, we're gonna put the graham crackers together and make little houses. <laughs> um, and we need help with cleanup, especially on, on Friday evening. So please take a look at the sign up sheet. We need help with lots of things still. Um, and then jumping to affiliate, there's a volunteer survey available. Uh, let us know what kinds of things you like to do, what you're good at, and we will try to match you up with uh, volunteer events. You can follow us on social media and invite a friend to join you at a Nehemiah event or buy them a gift certificate. And I think that was probably it. I'm going to give it back to Dan for the December challenge. And actually, I think um, Samantha, was I leading this or were you to kind of talk through this? On either way, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Denise. Thank you, thank you for stepping in and being here for us. Um, yeah, just a couple last things to cover. So as we reiterate in all of our sessions, allyship is a verb and it is a journey, not a destination. And it is absolutely not a title. And it is about the daily consistent practice. Um, and as Denise just shared, it's about all of the different ways that we can educate and donate and affiliate. Um, so please, if you did not have a chance to take some notes, um, Don has shared great opportunities, um, you know, and a recap of everything that we can be doing in, in the chat. So please make sure to sift through and decide what it is um, that you will be participating in and what you will do as your way to support. Um, in elevating our shared commitment as would-be allies, we always like to share our ally in action challenge. And for this month to uh, finish the year strong, we've chosen two. So the first is um, to commit to support diverse holiday events and volunteer opportunities in your area. So um, we've shared some awesome local opportunities and happenings here in Madison, Wisconsin, but your community, you know, of course has needs as well. Um, so please, you know, check it out and just and get involved. And then as an internal commitment, we really want to encourage you to take some time to reflect on the following, um, you know, in 2021, how have you grown this year? How have you gotten intentionally uncomfortable? What opportunities did you leave behind? Um, and what are your allyship commitments for the coming year? Um, so we really ask you just to take some time, ground yourself in those questions, maybe do some journaling or just take a moment after the session to think through those um, because it is about, you know, it is about the accomplishments and the missed opportunities, you know, those failures that keep us moving forward because it is a practice and we are all learning and unlearning. Um, and, and that's part of the growth for sure. Um, and because we don't ask you to do anything that we we wouldn't. I wanted to share um, part of my personal reflection is truly just the 
immeasurable learning opportunity and the critically imperative awakening um, that the Black History for a New Day course was for me this year. Truly, truly a transformative experience with plenty of opportunity to get uncomfortable <laughs> um, and just such an honor to have been able to participate in and um, complete that course. It just wrapped up last month. I wholeheartedly believe that all of humanity um, should be required to experience this course. And I cannot encourage you enough to get registered for the spring opportunity um, and, and just get involved with that offering. Dan, anything you would add? Yeah, I mean, the one thing I would add from 2021, so it, we were very open about what started this this series, and that was in um, re response to the George, George Floyd murder and that crisis that occurred. And I think we saw quite a few um, things caught on camera within a short period of time. And I think what I have thought of in 2021, right, COVID's been a thing that continues. And I think we start to stop talking about those challenges because they're not new, but the reality is they don't go away. And I think my biggest thing is in 2021, we've talked about it tonight, it's a marathon and not a sprint. And so what are the things that we've talked about? I know Kendra, you mentioned the microaggressions and stop focusing necessarily just for me on the big things that the news highlights and more about understanding this is a daily um, reality for the three of the the four of you plus everyone else in the black community and so what am i doing to show up authentically not performative not what am i reading but what am i doing to build those relationships in my daily life it's not the things that are about arguing with people on social media it's not about that but it's about what are the things that i'm doing on a daily basis and i think that's been hard for me because i'll be honest i can go back to my privileged life very easy I can go back to say, well, this is hard and this happened and, and I can justify that. But what I've been reflecting on is when I do that, think about how much harder it is for those who have that plus so many other things working mm -hmm. against them. And that's been my biggest, I would say, reflection this year is what am I doing daily, but also the exponential impacts that I don't have to experience. And so how am I showing up to support them um, every day? Mm -hmm. And so... I, I think with that, Samantha, I think we were just going to do some some closing comments. But I will say this is, a, again, a, a year and a half of this this series. We don't expect it to end anytime soon. So if there's always ideas, we will be sending out a survey. We want you to help drive future topics, future formats. We want this to bring value to, to everyone in attendance tonight. Definitely. Yeah. So I think in closing, just as Miss Kirby Mack reminds us, actions that speak louder than word words. And as Aaron Hicks said, get out of your own way. Um, and as Miss Kendra Whipple challenged us all tonight, defy the temptation to be inauthentic and don't be afraid to be great and do be a grandma Joan. Those are some of my note highlights <laughs> that I will continue to dig into long after this session. We're so, so grateful for your participation um, as special guests. Um, the three of you, thank you so much. And to Dr. G as always, um, to the Nehemiah Justified Anger team and to, uh, um, you know, to Dan and to AJ, this work is uh, is an honor um, and we are so grateful to have gotten to you know grow alongside this whole community throughout this year our next event our kickoff for next year will be january 25th we hope to see all of you and continue the work um, so thank you so much happy holidays and we will see you next time thanks everyone thank you Baby, baby bottle.
know I get busy. Paul's deck with Holly. Me and St. Nick about to take a sip and get jolly. If you've been good all year, throw your hands up and spread good cheer. And if you're standing under the mistletoe, let me hear you say, oh yeah.